Mr. Koskla, in your um, in your personal belief, what are the three most important things in life? Well, always do what you have fun at. Uh, I always prioritize family over any business thing, always, 100% of the time. And I only work on things that, where I think I can make a difference. Great. Thank, Thank you so much for your time. Having said that, there's another value that's very important, which is knowing the market you're trying to produce products for. So if you're trying to develop products for Africa, very hard to sit here and do it. We have this beautiful project to do schools in Kenya. Uh, so the founders were here, they were trying to play with things and decide they actually needed to be in Kenya and they moved to Nairobi and did the startup. They build physical schools and compete with the Kenyan government which offers free education. So it's hard to compete with free. Only way you can do it is with better. So they decided that they'll charge $6 a month, which to them is about $70 a year. Um, which is affordable even in Kenya, even at the bottom of the pyramid. Because incomes are probably 60 to $100 at the very low end of that constituency. Um, what they did is based it fully on the mobile phone. If a student hasn't paid his fees and shows up in class, the teacher knows his name is not on the roll call. They do electronic payments, so there's no office. Uh, everything the teacher teaches, because they have to train teachers, is on their cell phone in two to five minute increments. Uh, they completely, and their test is very simple. Are the parents happy or do they take the kids out of school and put them back in the government schools because they're not learning as much? Uh, here's the amazing part. With this model, they set up physical schools. Each school has about 300 students. They're opening three schools a week. Think about it. Within 90 days of starting a school, it fully fills up and is support uh, and self and profitable. So they've turned it into a McDonald's-like process uh, of starting a new school literally every other day. Uh, it's amazingly fast growth, great economics, school turns profitable within 90 days. It's very measurable. And you know you're providing a better education because they're going away from free, currently available resource to pay for it. Yeah, I think. Again, the point I want to make is innovation is possible anywhere, whether it's making hamburgers or making beef or machine learning. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I sort of gather from what you're saying is in many of those countries, there is a lot of room for innovation in the fundamental services, which in the US, there's not a lot going on there, but in these, like, edu they have basic education. So in a way, you can, there's a lot more opportunity there. Yeah. So my, to your original point, yeah, it's hard to know how to design a school for Africa without being in Africa. So it does encourage clusters of innovation. I think innovation is not a zero-sum game. So the more innovation pops up around the world, the, the better we are. Makes sense. We have one question from Sukhvinder. Sukhvinder. All right, so is this a good time to be an entrepreneur? Are you trying to time your entrepreneurship? <laughs> <laughs> so I think if it's a related question, you know, we are in an environment with lofty valuations and sort of, is this a bubble? Is this sort of a cyclical high or, you know, is this a good so, time to be an entrepreneur? So let me ask the reverse question, which, which I'm serious about. I have never understood why somebody would work for Cisco or a big company or HP, or pick your favorite. I just, it just blows my mind that anybody would want to do that. Right? It's always a good time to be an entrepreneur. Right? Um, during bubble times, you get the money easier. During the bad times, you get less competition. <laughs> Fewer people are starting companies. Um, you know, more seriously, I think, I've never imagined doing anything but being an entrepreneur or helping entrepreneurs. So I, I'm very biased and I'm not rational about this. Um, I can't even 
stay on the board of a company with 500 people. I mean, just, I get impatient. Um, um, so, being an entrepreneur shouldn't be driven by saying, I want to start a company. It should be driven by, I have some great insight that I want to make happen. That's an economic value add. And, or something I really have passion for, so I'm gonna jump in and figure it out. Like in healthcare, I just said, I, just, I know nothing about healthcare. I just said, I'm gonna jump in and figure it out. Uh, so, <coughs> when, you, when it's driven by passion, you do much better as an entrepreneur. People who say, I'm going to start a company and then force fit a company, the best they can think of. The best may not be good enough. That's usually not a good strategy. So in terms of any time you can start a company and it's a good time, both good times and bad times. Uh, one of the things I found that during bad times is the big companies cut off all their advanced R&D, so their best people get bored and want to leave and start something. So you can recruit much better during bad times. Uh, during the really good times, there's a lot more hype, a lot more competition, a lot more companies started, but money is easier to get, so if you fundamentally believe in your ideas. Yeah. Well, we have one question, which we'll let, because France is a special country. <laughs> we'll so let I the heard, audience. So I heard, first off, thanks for the, for the I like good wine, though. <laughs> <laughs> good food, yeah, I know. Um, thanks for the, the, the lesson, and you know, it makes me very humble to, to, to listen to. I'd like your perspective on uh, privacy and cybersecurity as we get into this fully connected world, and especially now that we start surrendering our judgment. How how do you see that? Um, how do you see that play? Uh, Did uh, everyone get the question? So the question is, what do I think of privacy and cybersecurity? <coughs> in this all-connected world. You know, first, cybersecurity is a really hard problem. Um, I think there's no good answer other than to say we will have uh, measures and countermeasures and counter countermeasures and this sort of an ongoing war. Um, it relates to privacy, um, and I'll come to that. Uh, I don't think we'll ever find a perfect solution, and I don't think most people want a perfect solution. Because mm. if they had a perfect solution, it'd be so inconvenient that you'd give up doing things. Who's tried to use RSA tokens? <laughs> yeah. Instead of just clicking your phone open. We will get better and better and get harder and harder. Two constituencies very hard to fight. National governments that are trying to spy on you. Mm. Just the resource imbalance is so large that it's hard to imagine how you fight that. You can make it harder, but not. On the privacy stuff, I actually think it's both important and overstated. By that, I mean the following. I'm not a big fan of the privacy advocates who say, shut down all facilities for everybody so that nobody can get any information. Personally, I'd like a dial, so I can dial up how much privacy I want and how much privacy I'm willing to give up to get other benefits back. If Google keeps track of every search I do, I'm really happy because they can get me better results faster. <clears throat> if Google, and Google's doing this now, and if you dig around enough, you'll find it. It shocked me how much information they had. I started digging and I found they knew every single location by date I've been to in the last year. So I could go to any day and find exactly where I was on a map. 
Now, I'd like to shut that off. <laughs> and they let you, but they make it really hard. Right? So I'd like a dial so different people can make different individual choices. Um, I think we'll get there as opposed to this blanket, don't do anything, or Google don't take pictures of any street. I do want pictures of street, it helps me with navigation. I'm willing to have my house get imaged just the same as every other place. And I'd like to make those facilities not available to anybody who doesn't want their house imaged so they can't see any other place either. Right? You make a choice. You're going to contribute to the common good and make your house and street imaged. If you opt out of it, then you don't get those facilities. That's a pretty easy trade-off to make, and then everybody can pick what they want, as opposed to some sort of German government legislation on privacy. So, but there's no simple answer. These are very complex and nuanced issues. We have one question from Ferhat. Ferhat? Right All right, all the questions seem to be from the front. <laughs> so, uh, Ferhat, maybe you opening a college fund, maybe? <laughs> yeah. This question is, in the, modern, in the modern economy, in the innovation economy, what's the role of a college degree? Mm. Well, we know you uh, work with uh, a lot of uh, college dropouts too, so what's the perspective for a national or otherwise education system here? So let me define my view. There's five or 10% of the people who don't need any degrees or any, any, because they're motivated enough, they will focus on what they're passionate about, they'll learn faster than anybody. And when my daughter, when she was in 10th grade, came to me and said, I want to drop out of college. And she had a very high GPA above four. We had a long conversation, but eventually I said, do what you want. Um, and she did drop out. And she never finished high school. But she did get into Stanford later. And she did finish Stanford. Which I tried to actually encourage her not to get her degree after she had met the requirement, because it'd be cooler to talk about no degree. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, you want to stand out a little bit. So I said, why don't you not pick up your certificate? She didn't for about six months, but then she said, no, Dad, I'm going to go get my certificate, my degree. Um, the motivated people don't need any formal system. The problem is the people at the bottom, the bottom half, really need very regimented systems because there is a lack of motivation whether people admit that or not. They have all these nice things about everybody has potential and all that. No, everybody's not equal. Otherwise, you should hire your people by throwing darts on the street uh, and not interview anybody. Um, there's, there's a hierarchy of competence there's multiple directions in which you can me measure competence and intelligence. Multiple intelligences is a well-established theory. So it is important, and for people in the middle, four-year degrees and some degree of guidance and regimentation helps. So there is no one answer, but the most interesting people actually don't need to have a college degree. Uh, also depends what you're doing. If you're doing something clever on a website, Snapchat or Facebook, you probably don't need that. You can learn programming and that's all the skill you need. And most of the learning to do Facebook successfully are, is iterative learning from actually engaging with customers on their Facebook page and iterating. <coughs> so no amount of college will teach you how to build a Facebook. On the other hand, if you're doing machine learning, you have to have solid grounding in math. You know, you, it's very hard, it's not impossible to be a serious machine uh, data scientist without having a PhD, mostly not in computer science, but probably in math or stats or bioinformatics or one of these really serious. So it depends on where you innovate. It's hard to be a material scientist and innovate in materials better steel or better glass, both of which we are doing. A 
told you there's opportunity everywhere, even making better glass for your windows. You're doing that. Uh, without sort of having serious <coughs> knowledge of physics and chemistry and, and semiconductor processes. So it depends on the area. You have one question in the back. <coughs> um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. And I'm actually very really pissed off at companies like Snapchat. You know, <laughs> that's actually a PhD in mathematics. So everything I build is complex. And, you know, my valuations have been like 10 million. And you can't compete with little bits of 1 million. Well, you're when, looking. When yeah. does this, I mean, I think, I, I, I think the summary of the question is life is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let, let me try and be helpful. Yeah. You're pissed off because you're saying somebody built something too easily. Okay? I don't say it's easy. Without a lot of competence yeah. or skills, yeah. sort of without the PhD degree. Yeah. But uh, like I said, there's some really great people who bring a certain level of intuition to recognizing what the market needs. Companies get valued on the value you provide to your consumers, not on the level of difficulty of the problem. Okay? And if you can, whether it's gut instinct, whether it's identifying a need, whether it's, if you can identify something that 50 million people need, you'll create pretty good valuation and are addicted to. Yeah. I've never used Snapchat, but they absolutely appeal to a lot of people, and so you should give them credit. Very different, so you may have very high IQ. It may be they have very high EQ, emotional quotient, and they got intuited. So one kind of intelligence is IQ, we all know that, we know how to measure. There's another kind of really valuable intelligence, and I call it people with lots of mirror neurons. I know how many people know what mirror neurons are. Okay, enough hands. Mirror neurons essentially in your brain mirror what's happening in the other person's brain. They're actually a type of neuron. This overly simplistic and incorrect explanation. <laughs> but the point is, the people with mirror neurons have a lot of empathy. Now you can't say IQ is more valuable than empathy. Mm -hmm. They are apples and oranges to the extent they help you service a need that other people have like Facebook did or Snapchat did. You have to give them credit. Yeah. You know, I've actually maybe the only person who's actually never played a mobile game in my life. But you still think they're amazing. I still think they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, spent a week at Thanksgiving and I couldn't get a, a, everybody, well, there was 20 of us, everybody except me was playing quiz up all week. Uh, I couldn't get it. I was reading. Um, <laughs> but I think you have to be a little more generous in your notion of what skill is, what intelligence is, and take a more multi-dimensional view of skill, and in fact recognize that businesses that create value for somebody else are the businesses that give value. Let me simplify it and say, not all hard things are valuable. Most valuable things are hard. Some are just really insightful. <laughs> Sir, I'm KP Chaudhary. I wrote a book on motivation while I was doing that. I collected a lot of quotations from every wisdom tradition, and I found a quote from yours. And I need to read that and ask you for explanation, because your quote is the Gita, Bible, Kabbalah, Tao, everything put together. Now I'm going to read it. Uh, it says, I have found that less people know, the more sure they are. It's sort of schizophrenic divide between worrying that you are uh, going out of business and dreaming big 
that's needed. Sophisticated entrepreneurs know this. Less sophisticated entrepreneurs don't even know whom to ask for advice. Uh, it's a big quote, but I think this itself, and I want to know about how people can create and uh, increase their capacity for the schizophrenic divide in their mind. Well, so I talked earlier about how to think big, act small, when I was answering the MVP question. How you do a factual reasoning versus long-term planning. Those are really important entrepreneurial tools. But think about it the following way. Uh, if you're reasonable as a person, how many people think they're reasonable? <laughs> Your hands. <laughs> You'll never be good entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> George Bernard Shaw said, human progress depends on the unreasonable man. He should have said man or woman, but I quote him with fidelity. Uh, he was politically incorrect. Um, Martin Luther King said, human progress depends on the socially maladjusted. Those are really important quotes. Because whether you're trying to make social change happen or entrepreneurial change happen, you have to be unreasonable. Because otherwise you'll do, if you're reasonable, you'll do the reasonable thing, and then six other people are doing the same reasonable thing. Right? So I really sort of suggest this. Now, to be unreasonable, you also have to be optimistic. You sort of have to believe things will work out. Even though everybody's telling you this is unreasonable and all the ways in which it can fail. It's important to have the optimism to say, I'll figure out all those problems. At the same time, you have to be paranoid that all these things people are saying aren't to be ignored. They used to be used to inform your strategy, question them critically and say, can I learn something from why this person told me why something won't work? And can I use it to improve my business plan? Whatever I'm doing. Use it to reduce my risk. Take one more factor out about why we <coughs> might fail. That's being paranoid. So you sort of have to be paranoid you're going to fail and optimistic somehow you'll figure it out over the long term. And that's why I use the schizophrenic personality quote. Uh, and, and it's sort of, that's why it's hard being an entrepreneur. And very few people can do both. And the people who are really arrogant and sort of think the world will work out often fail. Sometimes they get lucky. And you know, luck always plays a role. And all of you know people who got lucky and ended up in the right place, right time, the right startup, the right idea. Some are really very deeply thoughtful. Uh, <clears throat> so, you, the, the schizophrenia is between optimism and paranoia is really important. Andy Grove wrote a really important book on entrepreneurship in the 80s called Only the Paranoid Survive. I only like to add that only the optimists really think big and think unreasonable, unreasonably big, and you have to do both. Mm. Uh, so we have time for a couple of more questions. So one, I think Nikita. <laughs> All right, so the question was, you have and to- This gentleman's had his hand up for oh. a while, but let's go to this question, and then we'll go there. So you've got two options. You've got a company which offers high ROI as an investor. The second, which offers solving a bigger customer pain point, offering more value to the customer. Which is higher priority in terms of investment decision? Um, it depends on who you are what choices you make. What's important to you? Which goes back to, I did a slide in 1986. It said you have to know why you want to be an entrepreneur. Do you not want to have to carry the American Express card, which is sort of, you know, some people want to be famous? Do you not want to, want to want to balance your checkbook? You just want to be rich enough where you don't have to worry? Do you only want to work, you, do you not want to have a boss? Or do you want to just have a playpen where you can hire the people you like as opposed to the people who will do the job the best? 
<laughs> all perfectly good reasons. <laughs> Frankly, if I were to do a startup, I'd only work with people I'd actually have fun with as opposed to an asshole who'd be really helpful in one direction. <laughs> right? But those are personal choices and it depends on what stage of life you're at, what your value system is, all that. Let me answer it very specifically. I often say in our partnership when making investments, if I could have a larger impact in what I consider positive impact and get a lower return, I'll make that, do that every time. I say this publicly, I say it to our LPs, that's, but because I have the privilege of indulging that habit of mine, that desire of mine, it's just, and it's, I don't want to say it's superior in any way, I like that because it makes me feel good. I like chocolate because it makes me feel good. It's just things I like. Um, so everybody has to make their trade-offs for what they're willing to put up with. And this, it's the same answer to a question I get often asked, which is how do you balance entrepreneurship and building a company and family? These are personal choices. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, I would like your perspective and your feelings on wearable Okay. You're wearing something. <laughs> so Google Glasses, we are the original investors in Jawbone. We're in the first round of Misfit. Um, there's a bunch of other wearable things I can't yet talk about. But I think wearables is the wrong term. Wearables is a technology. Wearables isn't a need. I don't feel like I need to wear something. The question I ask is, what does it do for me that I find value? Okay? So, I had this discussion earlier today with somebody. If you say I want to build a wearable, it's the wrong way to approach it. If you say, here's an experience I'm going to create that gets people addicted and want to pull me out six times a day and it so happens that that is implement, that experience that consumers want is implemented through a device like a wearable or a watch. That's a much better way to think about wearables. Or any other area. People think about the technology, and I'm a technologist and I love technology, but you have to think about the experience for the consumer. And the consumer doesn't care if it's Snapchat with disappearing pictures that's easy to hack together or takes a PhD in math to do. Consumer cares about what's valuable to them for the business. Um, so that's the way to think about wearables. You know, it's, it sort of reminded me of a blog I wrote a long time ago when people were starting talking about nanotechnology. Are you investing in nanotechnology? No, I don't invest in nanotechnology, but I'll invest in a benefit that somebody can provide by using nanotechnology. Mm. And wearables is the same way. And it's true of every other area, and it's a common mistake among entrepreneurs, especially those who come from the technical side. We have one question from Abhi. So I, 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 let's make this our last question, because I actually have another appointment. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is our last question from audience question from Abhi. What do you think of accelerators, like YC or Others. <coughs> um, what do I think of accelerators? My answer to that is almost like my answer to the variables question. Accelerators by themselves are not good or bad. The question is, what does an accelerator do for an entrepreneur? Mm. By making it easy to do your startup because you don't have to worry about space or incorporation, you can just go someplace and park yourself, and it lowers the ben uh, barrier to, end to starting a company, that's really good. It allows people <coughs> to experiment in a much safer and closed environment without a lot of expectations, that's good. But the thing most entrepreneurs I think get wrong, more often than not. 
is what do they really need from an accelerator or an entrepreneur? And I think <coughs> the biggest thing an entrepreneur needs is good advice. Way more important than money. And they often think they need money. In the process, it comes with bad advice. And, and the normal things about an accelerator to your question are good. Like, hey, easy to get started, easy to start prototyping, less expectations, less outside commitments so you can explore a lot more. But in the end, an accelerator is only as good as the person at the accelerator advising you. And I come back to this question like, I would say, what has the team at the accelerator done to earn the right to advise entrepreneurs. I, I keep coming back to this. Entrepreneurs are normally super good at one thing and their experience is missing a bunch of other things. And that's what they need safety on. They screw up often, not because of what they know really well, but the things they didn't know they didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and good advice, or even advice on who to ask for advice, would be invaluable. Now, one of the hardest things <coughs> an entrepreneur does is decide whose advice to take on what topic. Thank you all very much. Mr. Koskla, in your um, in your personal belief, what are the three most important things in life? Well, always do what you have fun at. Uh, I always prioritize family over any business thing. Always, a hundred percent of the time, and I only work on things that, where I think I can make a difference. Great. Thank, Thank you so much for your time. Dig in a go, that 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 d